Welcome to Good Shepherd Baptist Church streaming services. Catch us at goodshepherdbaptist.org or on our Facebook page every Sunday at 10 a.m. Also join us on Mondays at 6 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. The days and times listed on your screen are also available on the website. In just a few moments, we will be joining Bishop Jeffrey L. Reeves Sr., Senior Pastor of Good Shepherd Baptist Church with today's message. We can be reached at goodshepherdbaptist.org. Follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, download the Good Shepherd app from the Apple iOS App Store, Google Play, or Amazon App Store. And giving online is easy. Go to goodshepherdbaptist.org and click the Give Online banner. Or, using the app, click the Give Online icon. Stay tuned for a few more announcements after the sermon. We now join Bishop Jeffrey L. Reeve Sr. with our message.
Lord, release your glory. Lord, release your power in this place. Woo. You are our everything. You are our everything. You're our source. You're our refuge. We can run into you and be safe. Our strength, you are joy, you are peace. Hallelujah. God that we serve, he is our all in all. We are grateful to God to be back before you on this Lord's Day to share with you what God has laid upon our hearts. 
Amen. These are some challenging times, and they are different to say the least. But I'm happy to report this morning that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. The immutable God remains unchanged, and he is still on the throne. I want you to bow your heads with us as we go into the word of God this morning. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you again for this signal honor and special privilege. Stand in your stead and place and to preach your word to your people. Grant us, O oh God, the grace that will make preaching easy. Lord, again, manage my mind and amplify my voice. Most of all, Lord, set my soul ablaze with your Holy Spirit. I pray. God, that your, the anointing that you have placed upon my life will come through and that people will be blessed. And moreover, your name will be glorified. I thank you, Lord, now in advance for all that you're going to say through your servant. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to invite your attention this morning as we make our way towards Pentecost, but I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles, on your devices, to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. And I want to read only verse 11 for the sake of time. I would that you would read the entire uh, 17th chapter of John. In fact, you can read chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 really to get a sense of all that Jesus is saying. But verse 11, and I want to read it uh, from the New International Version of the Bible. John chapter 17 and verse 11 says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Amen. As we look again at the first clause of verse 11, the scripture says again this, Jesus says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father, and here it comes. Protect them by the power of your name. I want to talk for a few moments this morning about a soliloquy for the saints. A soliloquy for the saints. Jesus says in verse 11 of John chapter 17, as he prays to God, he says to God, I will remain in the world no longer. By way of introduction, my friends, I want to suggest to you that Jesus' presence in the world was not only purposeful, but it was powerful. And for Jesus to say in this prayer, in John chapter 17, that I will remain in the world no longer. It's something that I suppose that the disciples of Jesus never wanted to hear. Because Jesus' presence in the world literally created shockwaves within the societal community. When Jesus was born of a virgin in a manger in Bethlehem, the world around him, as they knew it, was no longer the same. All of Jesus' life, there were moments when he was a child, but when he became an adult and accepted that it was time to begin his earthly ministry, the culture and the society in Jesus' day was no longer the same. Jesus' presence in the world was both important and influential. It challenged and exposed 
a cultural and political system that was disguised to be spiritual, to in fact be criminal and corrupt. Jesus, when he came on the scene, his very expression exposed the fact that those who claimed to be spiritual were anything but. Paul brings this up in one of his epistles where he reminds us of how we see ourselves in light of the Lord's reflection. That we are not all that we say that we are, and sometimes we are not all that we think we are. And all of that becomes exposed in the light of the Lord's presence. And so Jesus' presence in the world uh, was, was, uh, was, well, it challenged, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, that cultural and political system to be criminal and corrupt. How did he do it? Well, Jesus exposed that system because his presence in the earth was exclamated, if you will, by good works of justice and mercy and equality that were unmatched by the spiritual aristocracy of his day. It, this is the really uh, the undertone of of John's gospel. John helps us to understand that Jesus Christ was in fact the Son of God and that he had an ability that remained unmatched in his society. You remember it back in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came to have a meeting with Jesus at night and he admittedly said about Christ, he says that no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. I said Jesus' ministry, his presence in the world, it upset and threw over the apple cart. Again, he was doing good. As a matter of fact, he was healing the sick. And you know the record, he raised the dead. He literally changed the lives of many people. Jesus' presence in the world takes on a different shape and meaning when we hear Jesus say now that I will remain in the world no longer. I mean, in short, Jesus' presence in the world was like a bright light in the midst of systemic darkness. Jesus' presence in the world was like a breath of fresh air. And to hear Jesus say, after three years of ministry, three years of walking with his disciples, three years of cultivating relationships and, and changing cultures and systems, three years of getting people to believe that he was not just a carpenter's son from Nazareth, but that he was, in fact, the son of God, that he was the Messiah who was to come. To hear Jesus say, that I will remain in the world no longer. It's got to be hurtful. It has to be painful for his disciples. That's really the tension of the text. That's the problem with this prayer. Because in this prayer, Jesus proposes uh, that, that this prayer will be a parting prayer. I will not stay. I am leaving. And I guess the the question that we need to raise at this hour, what does it mean for us? And what did it mean for those who heard it? When Jesus said to them, as he talked to God in prayer, I will remain in the world no longer. Let me back up for a second and tell you that what Jesus articulates in the prayer is not something that he hasn't said already. He has said to his disciples, several times that uh, he was going to leave. In John's Gospel, John chapter 10, he clearly said that he would be leaving. He said, no man's going to take my life. He said, I'm going to lay it down of myself. Jesus has already said to them that he was going to leave. Maybe they thought he was going on vacation, or maybe they thought that he would be going on sabbatical only to return, but it's becoming clear now that when Jesus says, I will remain in the world no longer, that he is leaving and not ever to return. Or as we know now, as we read the scripture, he will return, but we don't know the day nor the hour. Again, I, I raised the question 
Jesus is leaving, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the disciples? May I suggest to you that Jesus is leaving means for the disciples, they're going to be left now with insecurities about their ability to continue in his absence. Oh, we love to sing and talk about the companionship that we have in the Christ. I grew up singing the song like many of you have, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. We have said in the language of our faith, one of the refrains is that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But, but what, what does one do when Jesus leaves? Glory to God. I mean, that's the question we got to ask. Jesus is praying it. He's talking to God, so I know he's telling the truth. Could it be like many of the disciples, we too are sometimes left with our insecurities about our ability to continue in his absence? I take you back over, amen, to the gospel of Luke where we see Jesus actually leaving. We're not just talking about his death. We're talking about his ascension. The Bible says, and he led them out as far as Bethany. The Bible says that he lifted up his hands and he blessed them and then he left them. May I suggest to you, again, the shock waves that were sent through the spiritual systems of the disciples caused them, while Jesus was ascending back to heaven, to just stare into the sky. Had it not been for the angels to say to them, why stand ye here gazing? The same way you see him go, he's coming back again. Child of God, I want you to hear me. Amen. That sometimes, amen, we are, we are thankful and we are grateful for the fact that the Lord is with us. But, but, but what will we do when the hour comes, when we are going to have to stand alone and on our own, when we're going to have to stand up in our most holy faith? When, how are we going to fare when all of the lessons that we have learned in Sunday school and all of the sermons that we have heard preached across the pulpit, all of the prayers that we have prayed previously, when is all of that going to be brought to bear because there is going to come an hour my brothers and sisters, where you're going to reach out for the Lord and he's going to seem so far away. The question is, do you have enough faith? Has the Lord already put enough within you that you're able to stand on that until the Lord returns? I want to tell you that Jesus is leaving means again that disciples are going to have some insecurities about their ability to continue in his absence. And may I suggest to you, that uh, Jesus is leaving also means for the world that they're going to be left without the criticism necessary to confront and challenge and change the corruption of their culture. I want to thank God for not only for the coming of Christ, but I want to thank God, amen, for sending a courageous Christ. I wish somebody would talk to me. This is, this is really really where I want to hang my hat because you got to understand that we often talk about the Lord being our savior. But I want to tell you, as I've said to you so many times before, that Jesus is not just our savior. Jesus is also our example. And Jesus is leaving means that if the disciples are left with insecurity, maybe they may not have the courage like Jesus did to criticize and to confront and to challenge and to demand, amen, that a corrupt culture change its ways. I wish y'all would help me. Can I tell you that to be Christian in the world today is to speak truth to power. Amen. Listen, this is why I say all the time that believers have got to find their voice and they've got to exercise their faith. As we move out, I'll make our way towards Pentecost. Everybody's going to be talking about shouting. Amen. But Pentecost ain't about shouting. Pentecost is about standing in defense. It's about being the Lord's witness. It's about opening up your mouth and speaking. It's, it's not about clapping hands. It's, it's not about waving hands. It's not about a song and a dance. Pentecost is about the saints opening up their mouth courageously, just like Peter did on the day of Pentecost and said to them that we are not drunk like some people suppose. He said, amen, but this is what the prophet Joel said should come. I wish I had time to talk about that, but he was clear 
clear, amen, in confronting and challenging those who were confused, amen, about what Christ was doing in their lives by way of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is leaving means, amen, that if Jesus doesn't pray, if something doesn't change, if something does not happen, then the world is going to be left without the necessary criticism. Can I suggest to you, amen, that in this hour where everybody's afraid, amen, seem like the saints, amen, are cowering to some extent in fear, amen. Nobody wants to stand up and speak out, and for those who do, amen, they are left to stand out there seemingly on their own. There are always a few because God always has somebody, amen, that will stand, but I'm saying by and large, amen, we've got to be, amen, what, 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 what the prophet Isaiah said that John would be. We've got to be like the voice of one that is crying in the wilderness. I wish somebody would help me. We're in the wilderness right now. Amen. You can call this season what you want to, but we are wandering around. We are not sure about what to do. Amen. And then it exposes the fact, amen, that we have systems that are designed to support us, but instead they have been redesigned and corrupted. I wish I had a witness here to exacerbate, amen, the ills and the anxieties that already exist within a society. There needs to be somebody like Jesus, amen, who will stand up, amen, and and confront the culture and say that this is not right. I wish I had a witness here. Can I tell you, my friends, that Jesus, when he says in the prayer, he said that I am leaving and I will, I'm not going to remain in the earth no more. Amen. Listen, it leaves the disciples with insecurities. It leaves the world without criticism. But it will also open the door for the revisionists of history to rewrite and record incorrectly the narrative of Jesus' life and ministry. It's, it's important my brothers and sisters that we make sure that we get the story straight. It's, it's important that we make sure that what we are sharing about Christ is accurate and true. This is where I, I, I want to leave you with this and tell you that when Jesus leaves, amen, unless something happens, amen, there will be people who will look at his life and death and tell and try to convince a world that he's still dead. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, that if something does not change in, in Jesus' leaving, if, if somebody doesn't step up and if somebody doesn't receive the mantle, if somebody doesn't understand that it's incumbent upon them now to pick up where Jesus left off, amen, people, amen, who want to rewrite and record, amen, history to their own suiting, amen, they will be left to do so unless somebody stands up. This is why I take you back again to Acts chapter 2 that Peter stood up and told him that uh, I know what y'all think it is but I'm here to tell you that this is that. Can I help somebody? Can I tell you it's important that somebody stand up and with clarity articulate with certainty come on amen who Christ is and what Christ did somebody ought to have a testimony somebody has got to have their own story that Jesus may have left amen but his spirit still lives in me and I've got a testimony to tell, amen, about the authenticity of his life, about the power of his death, and about the hope that remains in his resurrection. I'm here to tell you, child of God, amen, that Jesus understands that this is where the disciples and the world are. And so he prays to the Father. Can I park here and tell somebody, amen, that Jesus was not beyond praying. Amen. This is not the only instance in Scripture. Amen. There are many instances where within the Gospels that talk about Jesus departing and, and leaving uh, the disciples temporarily that he might go and find a place to pray. I said Jesus prayed. And if Jesus prayed, y'all, it's incumbent upon us, amen, to develop our own prayer life. Amen. Because we're not going to make it without prayer. I can't get nobody to help me right here. I said we're not going to make it without prayer. Amen. I don't care with all of your sophistication and savvy, you still need something, amen, of God in your life. And the only way to acquire it, amen, you've got to pray for it. Amen. As a matter of fact, amen, the Bible says, amen, as we talk about Pentecost, as we're getting there next Sunday, but I got to tell you that Jesus told the disciples, he said, listen, you guys, I got to wait. 
Amen. And that which I promise is going to come to you. Amen. The idea of waiting certainly suggests patience. Amen. But it suggests more importantly, a prayerful patience. That they ought to prayerfully, amen, and, and patiently wait, amen, for the promise of the Lord to be fulfilled. And the Bible says that when they were in the room together, they were praying. I can't get nobody to talk to me. Amen. Maybe they learned a lesson, amen, earlier from Jesus that there's power in prayer. I, I wish I had a witness here. And if you pray, God will give you what you need. If you pray, God will give you the ability to stand as he stood. I said, if you pray, God will give you the Holy Spirit's power. Amen. And the work that you saw Christ do, you'll be able to do it. And greater works will you be able to do because not only has he left you, but he left something in you. And so we look at the text as I close very quickly because I'm feeling funny already. Can I tell you that destiny having already been determined, Christ is now on a collision course that will lead him ultimately to the cross. There's no turning around now, and so Jesus prays. There's no going back now, Jesus prays. There's no getting to God to repent and change his mind, so Jesus prays. It, Jesus is clear that in a little while I'm getting out of here, but I want to pray for those that I'm leaving behind. Can I tell you, child of God, he prays in the prayer not only that God would get the glory, but he prays that his people would be protected. That's the part of the prayer that I want to hang my hat on this morning and tell you, child of God, amen, Jesus understanding that no matter how much people wanted him to avoid his death, he was going to die. No matter how many people said that he should come down from the cross, he knew he was going to stay there. And so he knew that the hour was going to come that all that he had put into those whom the Lord had given him they would now have to take the deposit that had been made in their life I wish I had a witness here and they were to reinvest it in the world they were to believe that the same spirit that was in Jesus I wish I had a witness here and with them amen that same spirit would now be in them and so he prays he prayed this is my brothers and sisters what I like to call the soliloquy for the saints. He, he, he prays that, Lord, I want you to protect them. Amen. I want you to keep them. That, that's the first part of the prayer. He said, Lord, I'm praying for their safety. He said, I've already told them that the world hates them. Amen. I've already told them, amen, that some of them, amen, are not only going to be challenged, but some of them may be killed. I've already told them, amen, that the reason why the world hates them is because because the world hated me. And can I park here and tell you, child of God, that if you claim to be on the Lord's side and the world doesn't hate you, you might want to check what side you're really on. Because when you're on the Lord's side, you're going to have enemies. I said when you're on the Lord's side, amen, being as Christ was in the world, amen, sets up a whole nother set of challenges in and of itself. You think you had problems before you get over on the Lord's side. There are going to be those that say they love you, but in truth, they really hate you. There are going to be those that smile in your face and then try to sabotage you behind their, your back. The same way they treated Jesus is the same way they're going to treat you. But I thank God that I heard the Lord pray. He said, Lord, protect them. He said, Lord, keep them. He said, Lord, corral them. He said, put a hedge of safety around them. He's saying, Lord, get in between them and the enemy so that before the enemy can reach them, he's got to go through you to do it. Have I got a witness in the building? He said, Lord, I'm praying for their safety. He said, but I'm also praying for similarity. He said, Lord, make them one. Have I got a witness in the building? Like you and I are one. May I suggest to you that the ability of Christ to operate effectively and without sin in the world was because he was the personification of God. 
He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was in the beginning before the world began. I wish I had time to preach here. There was similarity between God and Christ. And I heard, I heard Jesus pray. He said, make them similar. Make them the same. Make them the voice of one. Give them the same spirit. God, I wish I had somebody. This is the genius of God in the church. That he can take different people. Yes, and breathe out of them. A spiritual similarity. I heard Paul say, he said, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. Have I got a witness? You can't be on the Lord's side and have your own mind. You can't be God's witness and be independent of his power. You got to be similar. You got to be one in the spirit. Can I talk to the church for those of you who have anxiety about the fact that the building is closed and that even if we get back, we may have to practice social distancing. It may be a practice and protocol that may remain with us for a while. And you're worried about how can the church remain connected? May I suggest to you that the church can remain connected. It's not always about a physical connection, but it's about a spiritual connection. I admonish every one of you, amen, to be the same in the spirit. Have I got a witness? If I'm praying and you praying, and I'm praying the will of God, and you're praying the will of God, God will keep us on the same page. We'll demonstrate the same personality. I wish I had somebody. But here's where I want to close and tell you that Jesus prayed. He prayed for safety. He prayed for similarity. But then he prayed for synergy. He said, Lord, he said, make them one as we are one. Have I got a witness here? He said, Lord, I want you to keep them, protect them, keep them safe. Keep them the same by the power of your name. God, I got to get out of here. Can I tell you that in this little parting prayer that Jesus prayed, he suggests something that is of critical importance. That if you're going to pray, you're going to have to trust the power power of his name. God, I feel like preaching here. I said there's power in the name of Jesus. That name still has power. That name still has the ability to get the attention of God. And when you pray, you pray in that name because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God. When you pray, don't use your own name. When you pray, don't use the name of the bishop or the elder or the deacon or the missionary. But you better call that name, that name that God has elevated. Somebody ought to help me call him while you're sitting on the couch. Call that name through your mask. God will hear it when you call that name. Heaven will come to attention when you call that name. There's power in the name of Jesus in this season a pandemic I've been praying and calling on that name I've been sitting in my room sometime all by myself calling on that name cause Jesus is still the answer his name and nature is what the culture needs and the saints until he comes back we got to call we got to rest we got to believe in his holy name 
Come on, help me call it. I know you think that simply by saying it, it ain't going to do no good. But I dare you to call it the name Jesus. When I was sinking deep in sin and far from the peaceful shore, didn't know how to pray, was far away from God, all I did was call his name. He saved me. He sobered me. He set me on another path. And I'm here today to tell anybody that's willing to listen, there's power in his name. Yes, there's power in the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost power, life-changing power, culture-confronting power, system-changing power. I said there's power in his name. The power to protect you. The power to keep you. The power to help you to become like Jesus is. I take you back again to an earlier place in the Gospel of John. You see, you can't understand John 17 and 11 without understanding that it's a part of a whole book written by John. And you got to see this through his lenses. You got to see what he was trying to say. And in John 3, he said, listen, talking about Jesus, to them who became, hallelujah, excuse me, those that came to Christ, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. I'm going to add the daughters of God. But as many as believed on him, are you hearing what I'm saying? If you believe in the Lord, if you trust the power that is in him, if you trust the efficacy of his name and nature, the Bible says he will give you the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Don't you shrink back in this season. Don't you go silent in the midst of this struggle. You stand up and stand out. Speak up. Speak loud. Hallelujah. We are called to occupy until the Lord comes back. We are to do business and transact it on behalf of the kingdom. This is not the hour for you sitting around telling me, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, the Lord is waiting on you. He's waiting on you. He will give you the power. Listen, if you believed it before March, why can't you believe it May 24th? If you believed in Jesus, before 45 got on the air with a press conference, you tell me what has happened from now until then that has changed the power of Christ. I told you he's still the same. And if you believe it, the Lord will give you the power to become. I can't stay with you much longer, but I got to tell you the power to become is what I'm counting on. I'm not all that I should be, but I'm becoming. Shucks, I ain't all that I used to be. I'm becoming, you are becoming the sons of God. The more you believe, the more he will give you the power, the ability to be who you need to be, say what you need to say, do what you need to do, accomplish his will and purpose outside circumstances notwithstanding. You will still be able to do the will of God. Listen to me. He has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. 
Would you receive this morning this soliloquy for the saints? Hallelujah. This is for us. Let's pray like Jesus did, Lord. Keep us safe. Lord, by the power of your name, keep us together as one. We pray, Lord, that the similarity that you seek will be born out of a synergy as we work together, pray together, trust together. Bring us together, Lord. We know that it's the joint that supplies the strength. Despite all the enemy's efforts to keep us apart and to attack the cononia of the church, keep us together. Hallelujah. Lord, I know this is a prayer that you will answer because it's a prayer that Jesus prayed. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for joining us today for Good Shepherd Streaming Services. Giving online is easy. Go to goodshepherdbaptist.org and click the Give Online banner. Or using the app, click the Give Online icon. Follow us on social media on Facebook at Good Shepherd Baptist, Twitter and Instagram at Good Shepherd BC. And the Good Shepherd app is yet another great tool to keep connected. Download the Good Shepherd app from the Apple iOS App Store, Google Play, or Amazon App Store. We air every Sunday on Fox Richmond at 7.30 a.m. Please watch and support the broadcast. Good Shepherd Baptist Church, 2223 South Crater Road in Petersburg, Virginia. You may call at 804-732-5969. Building a church, developing a community expanding services, and impacting lives. We thank you for the support of this ministry. See you next time.